Well, I want to jump right into it. And the first th thing I want to ask is this, is that in this crucial hour of time, you know, you can, you can see the craziness going on all around the world right now. I wanted to uh -huh. ask you, if you were to stand before the body of Christ as a whole right now and to give a charge, if you, you had your, this was the message that you had to bring, what would be that charge that you would bring to the body of Christ right now in this hour? I would, first of all, remind the body that everything is going towards a certain end. And if you look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 17, it says, the spirit and the bride say, come and let the one who hears say, come and let the one who is thirsty come and let the one who wishes to take the water of life without cost. I would say that it's important to recognize that this is the last time the church is mentioned, which, which means this is where everything is headed. The bride. And what is the bride? The bride in its most basic and fundamental understanding is the church recognizing the bridegroom. A bride recognizes her bridegroom and she prepares herself for her bridegroom. Her eyes are upon her bridegroom. So I would say if I could stand and declare anything to the church right now, it would be this. Let us have the eyes of a bride that is 100% fixed, steady, set, single upon the man Christ Jesus. For this is where it's all heading. There will be a voice and a shout that says, come out and meet the bridegroom. And we want to come out and meet him with our hearts wholly his. There is nothing more shameful than the presence of your bridegroom when you have other lovers in your heart. The scripture says in 1 John 2, 28, abide in him so that when he appears, you will not be ashamed of him at his coming. In other words, let us link with him in love. Let us lean on our beloved in such a way that he is all of our, all of our strength, our total dependency. We look to him for provision and satisfaction and peace and joy, everything coming from him. When we have this, then we're truly bridal. The, the sad thing about the bridal movement today is that a lot of people have only adopted the language of it, mm. but there's a reality that is here and it is a single wholehearted love for the person of Jesus. So I would cry out and I would say, love him and give him the attention he deserves. Give him your heart because he alone is worthy of it. That's so beautiful. I love how you went right to the end of the, the Bible as well with that, just to help <laughs> us, bring, just to put it in so much context and so beautiful. Thank you for sharing that and segueing with just that message and you, and you carry it so, so well and so thankful for the way that you really contend to keep everything so centered mm -hmm. on Jesus yeah. with this year. When it comes to your prayer life, when you're alone with the Lord, what has been the framework of your prayer life specifically in 2020 with kind of everything going on? Could you share maybe uh, some of the potent phrases that tend to pop off your tongue in the secret place and some of the things that you're hearing regarding this hour of time when you're alone with the Lord? Well, I would say nothing has really changed from 19 to 20, I felt like him uh, to be so much more deserving of everything else. What I mean is he's so wonderful mm -hmm. and so worthy that to give the attention that he deserves to things far inferior, inferior than him is something that I fear. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I would say that it is important that he's lifted above all his things. He's lifted above all things because when he's not lifted up above all these things, then those things have power in our lives. We have Christ dominating power in our lives to the degree that we give all unto him. And so for me, it's been like this, Lord, there's many things going on, but I lift you above them all. Amen. There are many concerns but I lift you above them all. I have potential crises everywhere, but Lord, I am preoccupied with you. You 
deserve more uh, attention and you deserve worship. You deserve honor and glory, period. And so this is something I've got to continually do in my own heart because, I mean, we have families. We have a crazy country situation right now. We have uh, the, the devil he speaks, we have our bodies, we have all kinds of things that try to take the attention away from the person of Christ. And so coming alone with him, I must put him where he belongs because it puts me where I belong. Andrew Murray once said, humility is the dethronement of self and the enthronement of God. And I feel like this is the practice of, of every day, the necessary practice of every day for me. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. So for me, it's a, it is a, it is a exaltation of the man, Christ Jesus. And and the words that come off my mouth are something like this. You alone are worthy. You alone will always be worthy. You alone have always been worthy. I worship you. And things like this. Oh, how I love you. Oh, how my heart is yours. Take my mind and my being. These kinds of things I feel are setting our hearts, are setting our minds on things above. As Colossians 3, 1 says, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth or the things that are below. It's very important that our affection is put above because I think the only way to live on the earth as they do in heaven is to do on earth what they do in heaven, Mm. which is say worthy is the Lord. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Oh, wow. Praise it. It's so good. Uh, I I know that you've kind of already unpacked it by what you just said. If, if we had to isolate, what would you encourage other believers when they get into the secret place, we'll, maybe not only what you would encourage them to pray for, but encourage them to do like what would, and I know that this kind of can go a couple different directions, but I wanted to just say, what would you be your specific advice if you were telling somebody to, to go alone and pray? I would say your last couple of words, go alone and pray are, is very important because you're referencing Matthew chapter six, when Jesus teaches us how to pray, he says, go away. (laughs) It's so simple. We need that. (laughs) It is so simple that it's so often missed. We look at these words and we say, Jesus, God almighty is going to teach me how to pray. And we read past the very beginning, which he says, Mm -hmm. go into your closet, get away from everybody. So I would say, if you are watching this right now, or you're listening to this right now, and you want help and you're coming to the Lord, take this simple, practical piece of advice and get away from everyone. Even if it's only for a little while, maybe you can only get 30 minutes to yourself. Get away from people because it will help you be vulnerable. A lot of times people hold back a vulnerability that's necessary Mm. to touch God because they're able to be seen by others. So good. This is very important. As a matter of fact, when Jesus says, when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. <laughs> the word that he uses for hypocrites is, um, it is the word uh, interpreter from beneath. And mm. it has to do with masks being worn in the plays or uh, the, the, the stage plays. And so interpreter from underneath, meaning you're interpreting something from beneath a mask. And Jesus says, when you pray, don't be like the interpreters from beneath, those who wear masks. In other words, you can't, touch God unless your heart is vulnerable and you say things like, Oh Lord, I just, I need you so bad. I'm empty. I'm, my heart is hard. Lord, my, my prayers are cold, you know, that to quote the Keith Green song. Um, and I know how I ought to be alive to you and dead to me. What can be done for an old heart like mine? Please soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love, please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Uh, Mm. So it's this vulnerability that is so important and something as simple as getting away from everybody else will aid you tremendously and just letting your heart up to the Lord to, in in the way that will um, enable you to receive him. When the heart opens, the eyes open. Mm. When your heart opens in vulnerability, you can see the Lord. 
And that's how we receive the Lord is by perceiving the Lord. So I would encourage them with that. That's amazing. That's so good. And I, I've heard this and when I've, I've listened to you in the past, one thing that with, with this arena of the seeker place and when people are trying to even figure out what the seeker place would be on a practical sense, mm-hmm. I, I believe I heard it from you before. And if I, is that you literally have a, a, a room in your house or the closet where you literally uh, get away to be alone with the Lord. I, and I was, I was curious how important, how much would you emphasize even having like a actual place to get alone or whether that's something that you, you deck out and you make a private place or you just have a isolated place that you go would you would you say what would you emphasize on the importance of that yeah first i would say david says you hide me in the secret place of your presence you hide me in the secret place of your presence so i would say that the secret place is the presence of the lord Mm -hmm. Uh, it is a It's labeled a place because he takes you into himself. But this secret place is is anywhere. You can hide anywhere. But um, I think it is special to have a designated place just romantically. Mm. Because when you go into a place where you've been with him many times, your heart just kind of is triggered by the smell, by the feeling by just being there, you've been there so much with him that it becomes very emotional and it becomes an emotional connection because it's very romantic. It's almost like when you and your wife went on your honeymoon, let's say you took a candle with you and that candle was sandalwood or something. And it was a very special honeymoon that you had with her. You enjoyed her. She enjoyed you. It was the first of love and and the the fragrance that was in the room was sandalwood. Then you go back to work, it's been three or four months and things start getting just a little bit different and you're at work and somebody brings in a sandalwood candle and you smell that fragrance. You're like, oh, my wife, that's romance. It's, it's, it triggers remembrance, which is to relive something. And Jesus even says in Revelation, when he calls Ephesus to come back to him and to love him, he says, remember So I want you to come back to this. And so that's why I think having a specific place or places, maybe you have a couple that you do differently. They're very special in that way that it triggers romance. On the other hand, and I'll say this lastly, I have had times where things were so hectic and crazy at the house and I was burning with jealous desire to get away with God. I just got in the car and drove to an empty parking lot and sat there for five hours. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, Whatever you've got to do to get alone, do that. But it does help to have a a built up romantic exchange with him. And he remembers remembers these things and he'll call your mind to him. I've had many times before I went to preach, this will be the last thing I say. Before I went to preach and my nerves started to to go. And I'm like, man, I, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to say when I get up there. And I just close my eyes and <laughs> <laughs> And the Lord just shows me um, my chair that I sit Uh, in. And he's like, this is your confidence mm -hmm. that we've been together. And then I say things like this. Oh, Lord, though these are only syllables, may they carry the weight of the secret kisses that we have shared. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that that ministered to me on so many degrees, just as you're sharing that, uh, especially from hearing from a a minister point of view also, it's just like, it's just, it's so easy to sometimes allow a, a a lie of the enemy to come in. Like, Mm -hmm. did, are you really prepared? Are you, have you really? And uh, when you share that, that just ministered me so much because I feel the same way. Like I remember the walks I've taken with the Lord. I remember that there's a reason I'm standing here in this moment and it's not to glorify anyone, but you God. And I just, I wanted to carry that. So that's so beautiful, Eric. Thank you so much for bringing that, that beautiful truth. I, I know some of these things just, almost sound like they could bleed together, but that's the thing that's so amazing about the Lord. I wanted to ask you, so we're talking a little bit about the secret place. We're talking about getting alone with the Lord. Could you share, uh, I'm going to use this statement that 
even intimacy. When we hear the term intimacy in church culture, sometimes people, that's a foreign word to some Mm. Christians when it comes to God. Like the word intimacy sometimes is like foreign. And I was curious that if you had just some steps of practical navigation, uh, you know, we just talked about getting along with the Lord, but maybe some things to do with reading the word or some, some oh, yeah. daily steps that you take to make sure intimacy with the Lord, it stays at a flaming hot 10, so to say. Yeah. Um, I would first say before I answer this, that I don't claim infallibility by any means on these things. Um, these are just things that are precious to me. So if, if somebody can receive something from it, great. But if they feel like they, they have a different point of view or something, that's totally fine. I wouldn't fight anybody on it. It's just, they're just, this is just special to me. Amen. So when I come alone with the Lord, uh, I don't do anything until I've worshiped. Yeah, so I worship the Lord and get wrapped in the sweetness of his presence. As a matter of fact, let me explain what I mean by being wrapped in his, in his presence. Please do. When we're there, and he takes that center place when, when we're there in his sweet presence, that conscious presence of the Lord, I feel as if I need nothing. Mm. I feel like there's, there's, prayers, there's not a need for explanations. There's not a need for even direction. I feel like there's not even a need for me to bring my provisions. I feel like I have everything that I, I need. I feel I have trust given to me by him and peace and joy and satisfaction. I feel all fulfilled. I feel content with his countenance. I feel as if my heart begins to be my gift to him. And I feel like there is nothing else that I want to do. I feel that there's not even a place in this moment of being wrapped R-A-P-T in his presence. Like I'm not even looking to read or to pray or to act in any way. Uh, I'm just experiencing conscious union with him. And I feel that I'm doing in that moment, all I ever want to do. And I have everything I've ever wanted in that moment. Mm -hmm. And right there, I only want more of the same. It's just drinking. I feel absolutely needless. It just, it's just, the, his seeds then get into the soul when we become needless. It's all these needs on the inside of us that stop us from, from receiving the seeds of God. So I feel like there's no searching. I feel like there's no seeking. It's just conscious union with him. And I feel selfishness and the self-life and self-significance and self-gratification just become completely unnecessary. I'm so far removed from them. I feel like nothing else exists anymore. Mm. I feel vanities have vanished. I feel like life itself has been transcended by the person of Jesus. And when I say life itself, I mean even my wife, my kids, my uh, the esteem of men, food, even preparations, uh, even money, and all the things that crowd into our minds. I feel in that moment like I've been lifted above all of these things. I feel compared to him, all of these things become transient, uh, almost transparent. You can see straight through them. Uh, I feel as if uh, they, they basically disappear, but we know he gives these things to us in loving kindness, but I'm talking about that rapt moment. I feel like his love lifts me and kisses me into a higher existence. That's the essence of it. A, a keener senses, mm-hmm. a keener sense on the inside of him that uh, it's just em- eminent and, and his countenance is my contentment. So I, I would say that's the best way to describe what's happening in this rap state. And that to me is the goal. I'm not looking for anything beyond this. Mm-hmm. But when I'm there, he begins to guide. He begins to lead. And now it's about following and not accomplishing something because everything has been already accomplished by finding or being aware of him. That's the, that's the end all, but he's alive and he's a person. And he then begins to teach. He then begins to move me towards the word. He then begins to move me into prayer. So it's no longer my will imposed upon God, but being enveloped in God, God can lead me. And so for me, this is key. This is where, devotions become communion with God. 
a lot of people have devotions, but few people have communion. Mm. A lot of people go into the closet and they leave the same way they came in because they did everything but, but, but adore him. That's phenomenal. And, and I love how you, you, you quote the Lord, the Lord's prayer when it's put in is that's the first thing, you know, recognizing yeah. who you're speaking to Hallelujah. really just erases yeah. all the, you know, like, as soon as you realize who you're like, I even, I think that, and when you study like the disciples, you know, nobody had ever called God father um, in that. So when you, as soon as Jesus even said our father, I'm sure that they're all like, you know, just blown away by even the context and who they're speaking to. And yeah. I, I love how you bring that up because I see that a lot of times people use prayer as a means to become independent. Like God, give me an answer so I can come back to independency instead of using prayer as the means of learning dependence. That's really good. And it's, that's and if we could get to that, it's, and that's why when you're sharing that, I'm just being so ministered to because like, that's really so many times people are looking for, and that's why I'm even framing the questions I am like for practicalities. Cause I know that you're going to bring, bring us back to uh, the answers you would bring, would bring us back to the simplicity of intimacy. So thank you so much for sharing and bringing that clarity. It's so beautiful. And I was going to ask to help people with gauging this, what would you say are a few red flags that maybe you even notice in your own life that are indicators that my affection and my attention have left him? Uh, oh, this is good. So now I'll say I have these happen in my life uh, quite constantly. Every every so often, I begin to feel these things happen to me because we're always in need of a fresh vision of Jesus. There isn't a vision of Jesus that exempts you from having visions of Jesus. <laughs> every vision prepares you for a new vision. Amen. So he fills you and simultaneously expands your capacity. Then he fills you so he can simultaneously simultaneously expand your capacity to hold him and so it is with visions of him so it is as with that sweet wrapped bliss that we experience in just being conscious of his presence he is making all things new mm -hmm. again and again so i would say number one when i begin to find that my affections my heart is moved by something more than it is towards him Mm -hmm. This is key. If I can find that my affections are more attached to something, anything, doesn't matter what it is, more than him. If the name of Jesus doesn't move my heart, mm -hmm. then I know there's an issue. That's number one. Number two, I would say um, that his words mean more to me than anybody else's words. And if if my value of what he has to say to me in the scriptures is really weak, then I know this is a, there's a problem here because his words should be more precious to me than a thousand pieces of gold or silver. Hmm. That his, his words should be like apples underneath the tree, breaking in on my mouth with sweetness from another world. That's the way the word of God should be. And so if it's like chewing on an old rope, then there's a problem in the person's, in the person's life. I would also say that my desires are... Or must be behind his desires. In other words, if I find that what I want trumps what he wants, there's a problem. Mm. That my heart is is cold. My heart is growing stale. Um, and I would say, uh, yeah. So those are those are main ones that I find in my life. Uh, interest is you can always see what's going on in a man's heart by what he's interested in. Mm. And and I think when your interests move away from the presence of Jesus being experienced and his voice in the word and obeying his call on your life. If you lose those three things, any one of them, you know, there's a problem, but wonderful news. Jesus loves to revive us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just loves to revive us. So the moment you recognize these things, that's your way in. You tell him, Oh Lord, my heart is cold. Take my heart again. And he says, don't worry, I'll pick you up. He comes <laughs> leaping over the mountains of division and he picks you up and he takes you up into himself, into higher flames than you even had before. Amazing breakdown. That 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 helps me so much. I, I, I'm sure everybody watching, what a great way to gauge just where our affections are and just to keep things on such a biblical answer and such staying focused. I, I, I love it. 
in, in so much in, in my own life, I can just, I, I love when you were just bringing up the interest factor because I just notice in my own life, like if, if you know, in, even in, in light of what's going on, it's just so easy to get caught up in, oh, what is this news thing saying? What, and soon, <laughs> right. and soon, as soon as that stuff happens, I know automatically I'm becoming very anxious. I'm becoming in, engulfed in a conversation mm-hmm. that um, that is not going to change any anything. And, uh, I, and I just love how and I, I, I know this is a complete off the topic thing, but I, I want to thank you. I saw your one, uh, your one video with uh, when you were sharing about the election oh, and how yeah. I saw you got a little riff uh, uh, or a little <laughs> pullback from your first video and what a beautiful response you gave in the second one. And I, I encourage everybody to go subscribe to Eric's uh, YouTube channel oh, and uh, go, go, um, go watch that. Cause it, it really blessed me. And I really get where you're coming from with that. And when I hear that answer of just staying focused on mm-hmm. what's most important and you can gauge that if other things become more important yeah. or they're taking your interest, that's a clear indicator. Yes. I so, agree. so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I wanted to, if I go to this uh, question, this was one I had queued up and I wanted to also let everybody know your books are just phenomenal. I have, I have a, Right here, I have a I have a couple more in my library back there, but just a couple that I just absolutely love. Uh, enjoying the gospel, uh, this book is uh, that is just such a beautiful. And I was telling you before we came on the the golden lips of Christ, amazing uh, exposition of of John seventeen, and it's just beautiful. And then your quotes, oh, and uh, honey, this is just so beautiful. And actually, that was why I wanted to share. I wanted to bring up a, a quote that you that you shared, and it was, "If the public touch doesn't turn into a private kiss, yeah. it won't last." Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, this is such a profound quote. And the question that I wanted to feel to you regarding that quote, and I and I do want to give you permission to expound on it in the. The, any direction you wanted to, but I wanted to ask that how different is encountering the presence of God corporately compared to privately? And if you could elaborate on the significance of both. Mm-hmm. Definitely both are significant. I would never want to downplay what happens in public meetings. I mean, I was born again in a public meeting in the Brownsville Revival where people were getting blasted, man. I mean, it was crazy. I remember John Kilpatrick walking past me while he was praying for people. And I felt the glory of God come off him like a river and I lost all the strength in my legs. Mm -hmm. And it was something I couldn't even, I can't even like, it doesn't make any sense. It was really powerful. And there is so many things that happened to me when Steve Hill laid his hands on me. I could feel the glory of God go into me quickly and with power and strip stuff off me. When Benny Hinn prayed for me, I almost, I felt like I was going to vanish. It was a tremendous experience. You know, these are wonderful things, even in corporate worship. When Lyndall Cooley would lead worship in Brownsville, it was almost as if the heavens and the earth were one. Um, The rejoicing that happened was, I don't even know, it was, um, it was heavenly. Um, so yes, worship, the ministry of the word, my life has been shaped by men of God preaching the word of God. Mm. I owe my life to people like Dr. Brown, uh, to, uh, like uh, Bob Gladstone, Steve Hill, John Kilpatrick, you know, even, you know, th- these ones that I've been around, you know, changed my life. But I would say there are many people that experience all the things that I just said right now with me, mm. but they no longer walk with the Lord. Mm. So yeah. those public touches were supposed to bring you to private kisses. Mm. But if a man has public touches, but he doesn't yield to the leading and drawing and wooing of the spirit to go away, he misses the whole point of them. And that is to shut the door and experience your father who is in secret, experience the kisses of Christ to experience that that sweet touch of the spirit, because that's what keeps a man. I remember Lena Ravenhill once said, a man first collapses in the prayer closet, which, which means if a man collapses in his life, his closet collapsed first. Wow. And so I, I think it's very important that we say they're both significant because they very much are. But if there was never another meeting again, mm-hmm. 
you can live in a jail cell and be a fruitful tree whose leaf does not wither because you can plant yourself by the streams of living water who is Christ himself. No matter where you are in life, if you are in solitary confinement, that doesn't change the fact that you can sit in the shadow of his tree and his apples, his fruit be sweet to your taste. That's so beautiful, Eric. I, I was just reading uh, Second Timothy over the weekend and uh, Paul's last letter that he writes before he's about to be martyred. And every time I can't read Second Timothy without weeping, just because the statements that Paul makes, like out of the whole book, it's a verse or, or chapter one, verse 12, when Paul says that I suffer all these things because I know in whom I have believed. Wow. And he makes it so clear that, and this is why he's in jail, getting ready to be martyred. And that's why we are sharing this, that it wasn't in the principles he believed in. It wasn't <laughs> in just the, the, the theology. It wasn't in, in these things. He says, I know in whom I have believed. Yeah. And the fact that you bring that up about the importance of being alone with the Lord and that we hear about even John the Beloved writing the book of Revelation on an island being isolated from everyone and that this massive amount of truth and revelation came from men that were actually forced to be alone but they didn't allow the isolation to take away from the habitation of his presence and just being there so i just that ministers so much thank you for mm -hmm. elaborating on that um <laughs> Now, I love when you teach on the Holy Spirit, Eric, you bring so much clarity with this. I wanted to, if, if somebody's watching or you were to introduce the Holy Spirit to somebody that has no charismatic or Pentecostal background or no uh, uh, non-denominational roots, if you were to ex introduce the Holy Spirit to someone, how would you go about doing that? I, I would immediately take them to what Jesus said about him. Um, because the way Jesus talks about him in John, he talks about him like he is a person or as like he is, he is a person. So I would first of all, let them know that the Holy Spirit is a living person who has a personality. He has a voice. You know, we see in Acts 13, the apostles are worshiping the Lord and the Holy Spirit speaks to them set apart from me. So you, you have the Holy Spirit has a voice. And when Jesus says the spirit will not speak of his own, he'll speak what he hears. So he's listening. The spirit has ears to listen to the, the Lord and then communicate what he hears to you. He speaks what he hears. And the fact that the spirit is always with us is very important. He says he's, he's with you and he will be in you. This is the way Jesus speaks of him. And he speaks of him as a comforter, which is just tremendous <laughs> because people want to fight feelings left and right. But when Jesus named the spirit, the comforter, that kind of diminishes your whole, you know, combative argument. He does comfort. He's not comfort. He's not comfort like positionally or just theologically. He's comfort actually. Mm. And so it's, it's very important that we realize that he is the partner, the teacher, the leader, the strengthener, the standby, the guide, the advocate, the helper, the intercessor, the comforter, the counselor. When we realize this and that Jesus has said he would send him, then it is just a matter of receiving him. Jesus says, I think it's Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus says, if a father gives good gifts to his children, even when he's evil, mm. how much more? Will the heavenly father give the spirit to those who ask him? It's so simple that this is how it's missed. How much more will the heavenly father? It's interesting that he says heavenly father, because Jesus says that the spirit proceeds from the father. <laughs> I love that. He's, he's proceeding in the scripture. The word that's used there is he's flowing out of the father. It did, he didn't like flow out of the father to the earth. And now he's, he's flowing from the, he's a river flowing out from the father into the world. This is, this is who he is. And so I think it's important to recognize the simple reception of him. When Jesus says ask, it means a couple of things. Number one, it means you realize that you need him. Number two, that you can't get him yourself. He needs to be given to you. 
So asking is, Lord, I don't have this. Two, I need this. Three, only you can do this. Hmm. And that absolute bankruptcy is faith that receives the Spirit. And so I, uh, I would encourage anyone, the Holy Spirit is for you. Jesus died not just to take your sins away. He died to take your sins away so you could be a habitation for his presence. And so the new covenant is simply this, that we would receive his spirit on the inside and give us right desires and put the law in our hearts. And then the spirit will begin to cause us to walk in the ways of God. Striving is the curse. Enjoyment is the covenant. Mm -hmm. So the, we receive the spirit and the spirit then lives his life through us by us yielding. So now we do nothing. We yield and he does everything. That's the spiritual life. When the scripture talks about the fruit of the spirit, it's not your fruit. It's his fruit. It's the fruit that belongs to the spirit. Love is his love coming through. Joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These things are the result of the reception of the Spirit, I receive you, Holy Spirit. And then the, the fruit of receiving the Spirit will effortlessly come out. You don't have to work on your love. You receive the Spirit and He will be love through, through you. So I, I feel like this is very important. We find that when we receive the Spirit, we accomplish more on accident than we ever did on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so good, so good. Wow, that's so powerful. I wanted to ask you in with as of late mm -hmm. what are what are some is there any books of the bible or isolated passages of scripture sure. that have been very you just can't get your get away <laughs> from them i was just wanting to get your take on that right now yeah that's wonderful to ask uh john 14 verse 1 mm -hmm. jesus says don't let your heart be troubled he forbids distress do not let this happen to you. He is pushing them far away from everything that is outside of heavenly tranquility. He's saying, do not allow disruptions in your heart. It has no place in you. Do not do it. And then he connects it with belief in him. So he says, do not let your heart be troubled, but trust in me. Trouble and trust are mutually exclusive. Like <laughs> water and oil cannot mix so trust mm -hmm. and troubled heart cannot mix if we trust it removes the troubled heart if we have a troubled heart mm -hmm. it means we don't trust but then wow. jesus goes on and then he begins to tell them a couple of things and this is the root of why he's saying allowing trouble in your heart is absolutely ridiculous he's saying <laughs> if you allow trouble in your heart it's it's intolerable in this way, number one, he says, I'm leaving to build a house for you. <laughs> oh my goodness. So he says, you don't have to worry because I'm going away to make an everlasting dwelling for you. Keep that in your mind. It's like, if you want comfort in your heart, know this, he builds a place for you that lasts forever. This one is worthless compared to what's coming. Then mm -hmm. he moves on from there and he says to them that they, he gives them the power of prayer. He says, I will, I will answer your prayers. So if you have trouble pressing against your heart, remember that this world is not it. He's creating a better one. And if you have trouble pressing against your heart, remember he has granted to you to use his name in prayer, mm -hmm. to have power through prayer. Then he goes on and then he says, I am the way, the truth and the life. So he's saying, if trouble is pressing against your heart, remember this, I am right now, currently your way. I am your truth. I am your animation, your life. So he presents himself to them as all of these things needed to destroy trouble in the heart. Then he goes on and he says uh, even further, he says that he would uh, send the spirit to them. So now they have the spirit's presence on the inside. And just in case people think that that Receiving the spirit on the inside is just uh, figurative. He goes on to say, actually, th the comforter or the peace of God will be on the inside of you. Uh, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give, but I give to you the peace that I have. And we see all of these things. There's so many more in this passage, but you, you, the reception of the spirit, 
the the glory to come, the power in prayer, the disclosure of himself to us in verse 21. It's it makes distress in the heart almost disrespectful to God. It makes distrust in the heart actually a manifestation of not believing that Jesus did or is what he says he he is. So Jesus is saying, do not let trouble in your heart. Remember all these things that I am for you currently and what I'm doing for you in the future. So I, I encourage anyone to read through John 14, especially right now in this chaotic time and see that trouble has no place in your heart. We should be the most joyous, the most peaceful people, no matter what is happening around us, because we have a house being made for us somewhere else. We have fellowship with the spirit, the disclosure of Christ. We have the installation of the spirit. We have Jesus as our way, our truth, our life. We have joy that comes from him and we have peace that is his own peace given to us. That's so, so good. And I, John 14 through 17, I find myself in those chapters so much. So when you said that, I'm just like beaming. I'm just so excited. I, the gospel of John is just, what a treasure. I'm so thankful. And I, I once heard a minister saying, it goes so much with what you're saying is like, you know, when, if I were to plan a vacation or if I wanted to go be somewhere, if there was somewhere I was taking my wife, I would look for a beautiful place. I would look for Mm -hmm. somewhere that was desirable. And it's it's so amazing that God has chosen us to be the the place that he wants to reside. And it's, and so many times where people even thinking they're not worthy enough or thinking that there's insecurities, not realizing that the entire gospel, the good news is that God wants to dwell within you. Like what, I mean, what a beautiful thing when you're sharing this, I'm just, we get caught up in the trouble of this world and we have a, we have the creator of the universe desires to commune with (laughs) us. And and it's like, what are we talking about? (laughs) So true. (laughs) So uh, (laughs) as we continue to, to talk, I wanted to, I know that you're such a great, you do a lot of study and you go into a lot of different archives when it comes to church history and writing. Would yeah. you do the, Would you do us the honors and just share maybe a few of your favorite early church writers and maybe, sure. uh, and then also maybe a few books that you would even maybe, I, I know that it's probably hard, but maybe even like a top three or top five, or mm-hmm. you don't, don't feel pressured in that, but if you just have like some books that have really revolutionized your walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. I will have to start by saying, I don't know if I've read anybody that is flawless. So that's in, that's important. There's a couple people that are near flawless, but uh, when I say flawless, I mean with the way that I have seen the Lord to be, Mm -hmm. There are some of these people that I could recommend that I agree with a lot, but not everything. Some of these actually had heresies mixed in with their revelation. And I'm not sure if it was just a time that they were living in or what, but uh, I would say you'd have to take my recommendations with a recognition of the fact that you're going to have to spit out bones. You eat the meat and you spit out the bones. You test everything with the word of God. You test everything with, you know, the the plain text of the scripture. So uh, let me say that first, but I have thoroughly enjoyed Madame Guyon. Yeah. I have thoroughly enjoyed Richard Raleigh. I've Richard, uh, I've uh, experienced so much reading John Rusbrook. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love Andrew Murray's probably Andrew one of the, the closest to flawlessness I've ever experience aw tozer shifted my entire life on understanding what conscious presence should look like it is the tenets of our salvation is the conscious presence of god um i would probably say uh adolf Safur, all of the puritans oh the puritans uh, i haven't read all of them but i've read many of them samuel rutherford really touch touched my life john owen the glory of christ shook me um uh, who else is there? Flavel. Uh, there's just so many different. I mean, I could look at my shelf right now and I could see a bunch of people. Henry Suzo. I can see, you know, Climacus. Just so many. <laughs> there's so many. It's it's crazy. Mm-hmm. 
But uh, I would encourage people to be well-read because it helps you go beyond your scope. Uh, all of us have a, such a minimum view of things. So it's important to grab, I think, from other people. Uh, Watchman Nee really shifted my Watchman life. Nee, I, I, yeah. I really like Witnessly too, though some people didn't like him. I really love a lot of the things that he has said. St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, they're both tremendous in articulating certain things. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I also love in the modern writers that I've read that are still alive. I mean, I've read Michael's books, Kulianos, Michael, fan, uh, fantastic. I've read Kalinda's books. He is um, brilliant. Um, I've read through Michael Dow's books. I've read through, uh, you know, several other of my friends' books uh, as well. But I hope that helps, you know. No, I think really – yeah, I actually the thing that actually ministered to me the most when you're sh- I love the caveat you gave at the beginning because that that's such a wise way to present it because of the the scope and the the culture we live in the day we live in there are so many voices and I I actually was even confronted with something like this today somebody asked somebody something I I I recommended a little while ago and they pointed out something about that right. individual <laughs> and I that's why I get what you're saying and I yeah. the, and. I feel like that's so wise the way that you even presented that, that, that yeah. when we even can are I, recommending things. Yeah. yeah can, I, can I throw one more thing in here? It was Robert Murray McShane who said, you wouldn't deny a piece of gold because it came in a withered bag. Hmm. He said, you wouldn't deny fresh drink because the cup had a chip in it. I think that's the way we need to see these things. I love that. <laughs> Is that there, there's gold that comes through these things and just because it's in a withered bag, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness will be of God and not from humans, not from us. That's so good. No, thank you. And although I'll, I'll make sure that uh, when I even rewatch this, I'll, I'll make sure I write down some of the ones I didn't know because yeah, that was so good. And uh, I just love, I, I'm a big reader myself. I love to just, and that's why I even was telling you, one of my favorite modern day readers, I really love your stuff, Eric. It's really so enriching. And thank you I'm for Anthony's. being uh, disciplined to write those things. I know that it takes a, it's a price to sit down and write some of uh, all that. So uh and some of our closing things I wanted to ask you when it comes to humility, hmm. uh, I've been, when I, sometimes when I hear you minister on humility and some of the videos that you've done in sermons, you, um, you really exhibit that even in your character. And it's, it's, it's so beautiful. I was with all, when you brought up Andrew Murray, he's like the king of humility. I love like some <laughs> of his books on humility is so powerful. So powerful. I wanted to, ask would you do us the honor and just like share like a sermonette on yeah. humility like the the sure. importance of it in our daily walks with the lord i will look at can you see this yes okay this is really good it's up there next to um andrew murray's humility book it's fantastic it's actually called humility as well but it is extremely rich and one of the angles that he hits on here is self-righteousness and how we can act humble and in acting humble be manifesting pride and and so he, he really goes to the root of it that it has to be the work of the spirit i've i've often said humility is when our legs have been broken by the weight of god's presence Mm spending time in his presence breaks us down out of ourselves. It's, it's a weight that is put upon us. And I I like to say, sometimes I breathe easiest with the weight of his glory upon my chest. So I feel that way that humility is the result of being with him who is humble. Mm -hmm. So as you look at the meek one, he reproduces himself on the inside of us. We see in first John, it says, when we see him, we will become like him. And we know that's in the age, the age to go. Well, when he re- returns, we will see him and be transformed in a moment and be like him. But I feel there's a small sense of that even now that as we look at him, he makes us like him. So I believe that's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter two, what he writes, because he's trying to lift up the person and image of the meek and holy, humble God-man. 
so as to reproduce the same in them. I'm, I'm not sure if you know this, but a lot of theologians believe that the two women mentioned in the, the end of Philippians, I won't turn there, the two women in the end of Philippians that are not getting along are the reason why Paul writes about humility in the letter, is that it goes into our daily relationships with one another. It's the putting down of ourselves and the preferring of someone else above ourselves, which is the, the act of love. Love and humility are inseparable. They're the same exact thing. A humble person puts a person above themselves. A person that loves another one per person puts that person above themselves. So all that to say, I would say that humility is the key for dwelling in the presence of God. As a matter of fact, there's a scripture that really nails this down. It's in Isaiah 57. I'll just read it to the people. Um, but it says here, thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever and whose name is holy. Man, I dwell on a high and holy place and also with the contrite and the lowly of spirit in order to revive the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. Humility makes us the residents of God. God will not dwell in a prideful place, mm -hmm. but if we will come to him and look at him, he can condition us to house him. And that's the essence of humility. I would also make a distinguishing mark between humbling ourselves and humility. I would distinguish them like this. We come to him and humble ourselves by throwing everything at his feet and saying, only you are worthy. And I give all the attention over to you. Andrew Murray said, we're never more humble than when we adore him. Mm -hmm. So I would say, number one, that's humbling ourselves, coming to the feet of Jesus, bringing all of our sin, bringing all of our frustrations, bringing all of that vulnerable junk that is in our hearts and laying it all down at his feet. That's humbling ourselves. My pride, my ego, the way, it, my way, what the way that I want things to work out, what I'm expecting him to do, what I want from him. You take all this stuff and you lay it down at his feet saying, none of this is, is greater than you. You're worthy. You're greater and more worthy than anything else of attention. That's humbling ourselves. But what happens when we humble ourselves and go low, is just as Andrew Murray says, when you fill up a cup of water, water rushes in to fill the lowest place. And so it is with the Spirit. When we go low, the Holy Spirit fills us. And the result of the Spirit on the inside of a man is the character of Christ, which is humility. Then we can walk out humility as the character of Christ in us because we humbled ourselves to receive Christ into us. So I would see there's a difference between the two. We humble ourselves by coming to the feet of Jesus. He fills us with himself so we can walk like himself in, in the world. So, um, and this is something that I, am, I want um, so badly in my life. When I was in Bible college, I carried around the yellow copy of uh, Andrew Murray's humility book. And I read it during lunch. I read it constantly over and over again. Cause I was like, this is a problem in my life. I am prideful. I have it in my blood. It's in my veins. I'm prone to pride. So I need this humility deep inside my heart. And I find that even when I feel like I'm doing well with humility, I recognize pride. I was just with uh, some older people the other night that I really love and respect. And, and she was saying that the Lord showed her, uh, she was, I think she was in a forest. And as she was in the forest, it looked like there was just trees and things. Then all of a sudden, as she uh, got a little bit more light in the forest, she saw there was a soldier there with a, a arm uh, with a with a weapon, and she felt like the Lord told her that that soldier with that weapon was pride. He was able to to harm her. She couldn't see him until there was a little bit more light mm -hmm. in the forest. And so wow. sometimes we don't recognize how prideful we are until the light of His presence comes in closer. That's why humility is having our legs broken by the weight of God's presence. If we don't spend time in the presence of God, the very first thing that will happen is we'll become prideful. We can keep all the language the same, but our hearts are lifted up. We can say everything right. We can even respond to situations the same way, but the root is pride. 
and it does not please God. It's a stench unto the Lord. God is not just wanting men to do virtuous things. He wants something deeper on the inside of us, which is humility, which is the king of all virtues. I remember Cure Diaz once wrote, without humility, a man only has the appearance of virtues. I remember uh, one early Christian writer once wrote, we got to learn humility because we can't fight Satan with Satan. Wow. Uh, it's just a, it's a very important thing because it moves God. He loves it. He will s dwell with it. Uh, and without it, he won't dwell with a man. So I think if a man wants to walk with God, he should make humility the chief aim. Because in doing that, he gives Christ his chief place. Wow. It's very powerful. Philippi and Philippians 2 a just keeps sticking out to me. This so I just love the phrase and all Philippians 2 for that matter, but just when it says that that Christ became or Christ was humble and became obedient. Mm -hmm. That that it was his humility that actually brought the obedience and made it natural. Yeah. And I wanted you you did kind of allude to this. I wanted to share when I have one of your books right here, the uh, enjoying the gospel. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters that always just really uh, bless me is the one you're talking about the in, what the the gospel of his presence and like mm -hmm. just really kind of getting that. And one of the the quotes that you bring up with this is Matthew 11 when Jesus says, "Come to me," and it's yeah. just such a great segue with humility because he says, "Come to me, all you labor, heavy laden, and I will give you rest." And he yeah. says, "Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, humble, mm -hmm. and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light." The one thing that is so profound about this, with what you're sh sharing, is when he says, "Come to me," mm -hmm. this, and there's something that is actually this is an invitation and it's a daily invitation. And I, I just wanted to simply ask you, what does that invitation mean to you? Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's come to me and that there's actually something that's to be learned every time we come to him, mm -hmm. like there's a lesson to be learned. And I just didn't know if you could elaborate a little bit on that passage in your, when you're bringing that up, because it's so perfect with humility with mm -hmm. where we're talking. I think there's three words that Jesus says to us every single day, and it has come to me. And some people want a prophetic word, and I would line up everybody and say, I've got a prophetic word for every one of you. It's three words, come to me. It's our safety, it's our satisfaction. It's our, our, our joy and it's our guidance. You can't be led in life any more than you can be led without light. You need light to be led and coming to Jesus is coming to light so you can see. You can't live life without, without eating. And when you come to Christ, he is food and you have strength in you. If you don't come to Christ, you have no food and you, you get weak. We need to drink. We need, we thirst. And if we don't come to Christ, uh, we don't receive quenching of our thirst and we, we end up dying. Jesus is all things to us. He is the road that we walk on. If you don't come to Christ, you will never be on the right road. If, if you don't come to Christ, you don't have life. Jesus says you have no life in yourselves in John 6, showing us that if we do not come to him, there is no animation from the spirit. Coming to Jesus every single day is the only Christian life that there is. Mm -hmm. It's the only relationship with God that there is. Without coming to Jesus every day, we testify to God. He's not enough for us. If we don't come to Jesus every day, we testify to God that we are self-sufficient. Well, I, I can do this without you. Coming to Jesus is a recognition of our insufficiency and coming to Jesus is a, is a declaration to him. I realize who you are and I realize what I am without you. Coming to Jesus is a recognition of my, my, uh, my need, my deep need. And so therefore coming to Jesus is the act of humility. It is the humbling of ourselves, I, I, I would say. And so um, 
a lot of times when I come in here, I pray right there in that chair that's behind me. And I sit down and many times I will start by reminding myself of the gospel. I am a sinner apart from Christ. I deserve hell apart from Christ. My mind, my heart, my whole being is wicked thoroughly without Christ. But a savior has come and he has lived perfectly in the world on my behalf so that he could take my sin upon him and die in my stead and and then rise with newness of life and ascend on high to sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and send the Spirit into my heart. So I bow my knee again, Lord, to this wonderful man, Christ Jesus, and receive him as my Lord and my Savior and my very best friend, as my satisfaction and my fulfillment, as my bridegroom, the fulfillment of my love, my peace, my patience, my goodness. I come to you empty and bankrupt, totally needing you today. I give my life to you and I receive your imputed righteousness and your precious Holy Spirit so that I might walk in union with you. So for me, that's the essence of what it looks like to come to Jesus. It is inseparable from realizing we have to leave ourselves in order to come to him. It's inseparable from realizing our great need for him who alone can give us rest from all the turmoil that is on the inside of us and in our world. Amen. Amen. One phrase that you've brought up uh, before, and I've, I've actually can say, I, I've really, this was a, this was something that was very new to me when you brought this up, but it made so much sense when the Holy Spirit, you know, spoke it through you. I really believe this would be freeing to a lot of people. I once heard you talk about the difference that in church culture that we hear the phrase pressing in a mm-hmm. lot, mm-hmm. pressing in. And you brought up something that brings so much liberty to that process of sometimes what people kind of think pressing in is, Mm -hmm. which can be a lot bound with works or bound with things. You bring up the phrase leaning in instead Mm -hmm. of pressing in. I I just, I feel like this would be a a really great place to kind of um, close out too with just because we're so thankful you carved some time out to be with us. Uh, this is such a, a thing that I find that people, they kind of push a lot in arena. And I just wanted to simply, if you could elaborate on how the Lord's revealed the difference between pressing in and leaning into you and why leaning in is the the, the better way. <laughs> in Song of Solomon, the bride doesn't say, I'm going to kiss him. She says, let him kiss me. So I find that intimacy with the Lord is connected to yielding more than it is a action or a, or a pressing in. I find that the presence of the Lord is sank into. It's a, it's a recognition. It's a, it's a yielding into him more than it is something that I conjure up like a seance or like, like dancing around a fire, you know, trying to conjure up the presence of the Lord. It's, it's so much easier to just lean and recognize that he's with us. If anybody hasn't read the book practice of the presence of God by brother Lawrence, Mm -hmm. I encourage you to grab it. It's a, it's tremendous because he really has a way of explaining the recognition of God's presence. I remember Hannah Whithall Smith in her precious book, Christian Secret of a Happy Life. She said, I find all these people trying to enter the presence of the God, uh, uh, trying to enter the presence of God. And then she says, but when I read the Bible, all I see is you can't get out of it. <laughs> it's everywhere. And so I think if you, if, if we as a church would switch our minds to realize he's swallowed up the universe in himself. So I don't need to do anything to make him reign. I just become aware of his presence here. And Jesus himself um, constantly walks in, in God's presence. We see him always looking up just in a second. He acknowledges his father. We see David says, if I make my bed in hell, you're there because his presence is recognized. So I would encourage people to, when they get alone with God, 
not try to fight him <laughs> or push him or press him. Just lean back and he'll kiss you. That's so, so beautiful. And I, like I said, when I first heard you minister on that, uh, just to testify for people watching when that just that ministered to me so much because I do, I, I know it, it's so easy to kind of, in, in the world that we live in, we, we constantly think we have to conjure something up, not realizing that the statements that we've just made the past couple questions, he's come to me and he doesn't say come to me and do a dance or come to me. And, and, and not to say that those things are, it, you know, the, the Bible does say dance before the Lord. And, and there is things of that. But when he says come to him, it's just simply come. And then from there, the sources and you just, you, you get so blessed by that. So I, it's so liberating to know just to lean in. Yeah. So Eric, we're so thankful to have you uh, with us this evening. And uh, I, could I just ask you one more thing right before we sure. close out in prayer? I wanted to ask you this. I know right before we came on with you being able to travel around and uh, go all over the world, such a blessing with, uh, with where we're headed I've heard, I have heard a lot of uh, well-respected men of God just talking about what they kind of see and seeing great outpourings and things. And I know with your heart, getting alone with the Lord is so pivotal. Is there anything that you've been kind of seeing when you've been out on the road that's kind of like a consistent thread that you're seeing uh, unique outpourings of the Spirit of God? And uh, I just was curious of that, of just a a consistent thing you may be seeing and you think that we're on the brink of as the body of Christ of experiencing? You know, something started happening in London a few years back and it's recently started to happen a lot more frequently. At the end of ministry or at the end of preaching of the word, I'll say, the entire place becomes completely still. Nobody moves. Just complete silence and when I talk to people afterwards, they say, I didn't want to move. They were so overwhelmed with a satisfying, conscious presence of God that they didn't even want to move a finger. Just stuck, still frozen in sweetness, really. And uh, it's, been, it's been happening quite a bit more since uh, the turn of this year. It, it had happened many times in the past, but not so frequent mm. as it is right now. So that's the only thing that I've been seeing. And I think it might be indicative of the fact that God wants to be in his holy temple and the, all the earth be silent before him. He performs a deep deliverance in the heart and in the mind by simply expelling all sound with his, with his person. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for even sharing that with us. If if you could do us the honors, I want to also let everybody know that we put the up in the description. You can follow Eric on multiple social media platforms, Facebook, and I put all the links in there. Go to his website and also, and whenever a man of God uh, takes time to just sow, I just encourage everyone to just uh, sow into Sonship. My wife and I, we're so thankful to be partners with Sonship on a monthly basis. And we just see the fruit of what, what this ministry is doing. And it's bringing people into a deeper experience with the presence of God. And that that is so important in this hour. So we just encourage everybody to uh, to look into all of his resources and consider being a partner with him. He's such a, uh, him and his ministry, so, such a beautiful Thing in this hour. Could you do us the honor, Eric, and just uh, sure. uh, close us out in prayer and just anything you specifically just feel led to pray over those that are watching? And uh, we would just be honored to have you just uh, pray over us. Yeah. If you're watching right now and you can, just put your hand over your heart and just breathe in deep and breathe out. Yeah, do it one more time. Just breathe in. Breathe out. Just rest. Rest is the realm of reception. Jesus, I worship you. I praise you, Lord. There's not another like you. Not one. Not even one. I praise you. Thank you. We recognize your presence here. We thank you that the blood has torn the veil from top to bottom, 
for anyone, whosoever will, can come in and experience the wonder of your person and be delivered from themselves. We praise you. I worship you. I pray even right now you would soothe and excite every heart with your love that they would see you leaping over the mountains to get to them, to wash them clean, to hold them close, to stand with them, to kiss them with the kisses of your mouth. Father, I thank you for the divine shadow that protects us. And I ask, Lord, that you would cast it over every person. I pray each one will feel, 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 a new grace that woos them to come away with you and to enjoy sweet worship, presence, word, worship, presence, word, prayer. Lord, may they just have these three golden pipes through which the golden oil flows, flowing constantly in their lives. Take the mundane, Lord, and turn it into a garden of spices with their beloved. Make us all Marys who look and live, who value your feet over everything else. May we place whatever it is next to your feet and watch it disappear. In your precious name, amen. Amen.